Well, I like this. I haven't even done a thing and I'm already getting my first applause. Thank you very much. We are here for a piano valentines. I hope you all didn't look at the weather forecast for Friday. So let's just celebrate before we freeze here. On my program are just the most romantic piano pieces I could think of to get us into the spirit for Friday. And I have two pieces by Claude Debussy right out of the gate for you. One slow, one fast. And I will always tell you a little bit about each piece that I'm going to play. So let me start, we're going piece by piece with what's called Bruyere. Bruyere means heathers. And heathers, that's a little plant. It's like a bush that blooms purple for those of you who like gardening and herbal knowledge and all that kind of stuff. But Bruyere is also a city in France and it's surrounded by this bush. And when the season is right, you wouldn't believe, I looked it up on the internet, the hills are alight with purple and violets. It's gorgeous. And Debussy sets exactly that to music. He looks first at that little plant with a very simple tune. So you hear him come out and it's really simple at first. And then gradually, more and more, you get your eyes further into the distance and you see that beautiful coloring all around that beautiful city of Bruyere in France. So here it is, a prelude by impressionist Claude Debussy called Heathers. We're going right on to a completely different piece of music, which is called Fireworks. Also a prelude by Claude Debussy, but boy, it is very different. First of all, it is much more modern in sound, and it describes a firework. So you hear rockets and things like that. However, this is a firework of Debussy's time, so we don't have these amazing shows that are computer coordinated that we have now. But it's much more simple about sparks and flames and wheels and that sort of thing. What's really interesting is that at the end of the piece, 
Claude Debussy throws a teeny, tiny bit of the national anthem of France into the piece. Why does he do it? Because the fireworks were always played on the Bastille Day, which is sort of like the French version of the 4th of July. So they have their national anthem played on that day by a band. And the way that Debussy does it is he plays the music and suddenly you hear that national anthem as if now that the sparks of the firework have settled down, we can hear the band playing that was playing all along. I will show you a little bit what you have to listen to because I have to also tell you before you don't hear that national anthem, you cannot clap because there's general pauses in this whole piece. So he makes a racket and suddenly it's super quiet. So you gotta wait until you hear this. Don't clap before. <laughs>
Could you hear that little bit of the national anthem? I didn't hear anybody clap, so that's a good sign. You must have heard it. Very good. We are going on to an American composer that one doesn't hear so much of. His name is Charles Griffiths, and he actually lived in the teens of the century, so about 110 years ago in Manhattan. And if you read this man's bio, whew, you should read it. It's amazing. He sort of lived in the underground world of Manhattan, the world of opium hells and of debauched life, if you will. He didn't have a very long life, and his output was also not very big. And there's one other thing. He writes a piano sonata, and that is a kind of an edgy piece. Personally, I don't like it so much, and I guess I'm on television now that I said it. But, so I'm always thinking, oh, Griffiths, piano music, and then I'm coming across these pieces, and I'm just absolutely loving them. So here is one that's called The Night Winds, and it has a title that refers to a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. You know Edgar Allan Poe with the gruesome stuff? Exactly that, Edgar Allan Poe. And this poem describes the night falling and throwing its pal. A pal is an, a, a cloth you put over a casket, actually, over a lake. So it gets dark, and the lake gets dark as well. But then he does a weird turn. He said how the lake turns gruesome as it's all black and lying there all still. And exactly that line of the gruesome lake is what Griffiths picks and puts it on top of his piece that I'll play to you. So you have to imagine night falling and you look at what seems to be a relatively innocent lake there. And suddenly you kind of feel how your tackles in the back of your neck go up there because something isn't quite right. That's the music of Charles Griffiths called The Night Winds. think it sounds a little bit dangerous, that Black Lake? I feel that way. It's when he plays those ending chords that I think, whoa, better get my car and get out of there, basically. 
We're now doing something completely different by Franz Schubert, quite romantic. It's a late piece by him. He's written three Klavierstücke, which just means piano pieces. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Schubert. Schubert was quite a recluse in Vienna, um, mostly because he was gay, and at the time that wasn't, was not acceptable. He had friends, he had circle of friends, but he actually lived alone a lot. And actual witnesses say that whenever you went by his window, you saw the lights on, but there was never anybody with him up there. It was always him writing music. So he was alone. Now, when you go into the songs of Franz Schubert, and he's written almost 600 songs, we can kind of deduct how he sees life by how he writes about the texts in the songs. And there's a very famous cycle that's called Die Winterreise, which means a winter's journey. And in that winter's journey, he depicts a man who walks through a town and looks at other people's celebration of the holidays. And he looks into the windows, and there they are, and it's nice light and warm, and the children and the meal. But he is out here all by himself. Now you would think a composer who sets that sort of story would set the himself part in the minor mode, which is the saddest we can do on the piano, and would set the people celebrating the holidays in the major mode, but not Franz Schubert. He turns the two modes around. The reason for that is that he's accepted his fate. He's out here in the cold, and that's okay. It'll never change. So he makes that a kind of a cringe-worthy major mode, if you will. And then he makes minor the people who sit inside that have it so good, but yet it is unobtainable because he's not part of that society. So there's a real wall between him and happiness, if you will. And maybe that's exactly why there are millions of people who are so attracted to this music. Let's now listen to one of the last pieces Franz Schubert wrote in his life. One little extra tidbit I give you today is that researchers do not know how Franz Schubert was able to write down the physical notes of his compositions. How to actually physically write it down because there are so many pieces by the man. So they actually tell it up how much time it would take. He died at age 32 and people come to the conclusion it's almost not possible, but we know it's all his handwriting. So as you think about things and about your life, perhaps, as you listen to this piece, think about the man walking outside in the cold, like on the 14th coming up. And there are the other people that are so much happier. And it's quite OK. It's actually OK. <laughs>
makes you think this sort of music, doesn't it? We're carrying on to a completely different uh, composer, Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt traveled a lot. He went to Italy, which was far at the time. This was all on foot. Much of it was on foot. And he went to Switzerland. He actually took two trips to Italy and one trip to Switzerland that were extended, but he took also many shorter trips all over creation, which must have been very strenuous. So I think these olden days composers were hardy kind of people, cold in this weather, in the coach, no heat, that sort of thing. Well, anyway, Franz Liszt went to Italy and fell in love with a very old poet from the Renaissance. The guy's name is Petrarch, and he wrote like many people in the Renaissance did, like Shakespeare did too, sonettos or sonnets. And these always describe something, and then at the end you get a double line that sort of gives you the the punchline, if you will, of the poem. Many of the sonnets by this Petrarch are about love, and they always compare love to something else. What better to play for you today, two days out before Valentine's Day? So this poem is not such a romantic thing because it's actually a soldier who comes back from the war, and he compares the wounds of war to the wounds he receives in love. And at the end, you'll see he goes through the wounds of war and you'll hear it's all martialic sounding. Then he goes to the wounds of love and it sounds all swooning. You'll hear that very clearly. But at the end, remember there's always a two-line punchline and he says he prefers any day the wounds of love over the ones he received in war. So here's sonetto number 104, Petrarch wrote a lot of sonettos, written to music by Franz Liszt.
guest on the program is Frédéric Chopin, Empruntu Fantasy, maybe the ultimate romantic piece for the piano, two days before Valentine's Day. Just quickly to the time the piece was composed, Frédéric Chopin was actually on the island of Mallorca when he conceived of this piece. He did not live in Paris at that time in his life. And he encapsulates quite a lot of his experiences from the island because although they had gone there in order to get clear air in nice Mediterranean weather, it was very bad winter weather the whole time, which made Chopin sicker and sicker. He struggled with tuberculosis his whole life long. So you will hear the weather and the excitement of the island being whipped by the wind, but you'll also hear a very romantic middle section, perhaps dreaming of sunnier days. <clears throat>
Last not least, it is called the Russell of Spring. I thought I should bring something springy. I'm hoping really hard that we're there soon. It is by Christian Sinding, who is actually a forgotten composer. He wrote symphonies, chamber music, you name it, all sorts of different and large output. There's only one single piece that the guy is famous for. And now this piece is not, not played any longer. So I thought, you know, I should bring it back and make people remember this composer has written so much gorgeous stuff. So here's maybe his most famous piece. Actually, if you look in the piano benches of your grandparents, you might have the sheet music lying right in there. Thank you.